ruin my life, <clears throat> destroy my plans. Just a, just a lot of challenging, challenging stuff already this morning. And here we are, just one month into the new year, and talk about having plans. I'm assuming that by now most of us have pretty much abandoned our New Year's resolutions. Usually happens right about now, and all that this desire to start anew is quickly becoming a faded memory. And as we head towards Super Bowl weekend, everybody's thoughts turn naturally to food. Because the Super Bowl is that sacred weekend when people consume more food than human beings were ever intended to. And some of us, in preparation, we try and lose a few pounds before the big game so we can create a sort of zero-sum gain when we're done gorging ourselves. You know, and then the recent cold weather's out there and closed schools, and that creates a sort of circumstance that will cause people to clean out the refrigerator and not in the healthiest way. I, when schools are closed, I don't even have kids in the house. Schools are closed, I eat more. I don't know why. I just do. So we have all probably feel like we've got a couple of pounds and inches that we can stand to lose as quickly as possible in preparation for game day and all the food that brings with it. So can it be done? Well, recently somebody sent me what is known as the toddler miracle diet. It seems some very enterprising person was able to formulate a diet based on the eating patterns of two-year-olds. And all I can say is that I've reviewed it. It is inexpensive. It offers great variety and quantities. And best of all, it works in four days, which is just in time for the Super Bowl. So here's how it goes. Day one, one scrambled egg, one piece of toast with grape jelly. Eat two bites of the egg, dump the rest on the floor. Take one bite of the toast, then smear the jelly all over your face and clothes. Lunch. Four crayons, any color, a handful of potato chips, and a glass of milk. Three sips only, then spill the rest. Dinner, a dry stick, two pennies, a nickel, and four sips of flat Pepsi. Bedtime snack, toast a piece of bread and then toss it on the kitchen floor. Day two, breakfast, pick up the stale toast from the kitchen floor and eat it. Drink half a bottle of vanilla extract or one vial of vegetable dye. A dye. Lunch, half a tube of pulsating pink lipstick, a handful of Purina dog chow, any flavor, one ice cube, if desired. Afternoon snack, lick an all-day sucker until it's sticky, take it outside, drop it in the dirt, retrieve and continue slurping it until it's clean again. Then bring it inside and drop it on the rug. For dinner, a rock, a pebble, or an uncooked bean, which should be thrust up your left nostril. <laughs> Pour grape Kool-Aid over mashed potatoes and eat with a spoon. Day three, we're halfway through. Day three, breakfast. Two pancakes with plenty of syrup. Eat one, stuff the other pancake in a glass of milk. After breakfast, pick up yesterday's lollipop from the rug, lift off the fuzz, and then place it on the cushion of your best chair. Lunch, three matches, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, spit several bites on the floor, pour a glass of milk on the table, and slurp that up. For dinner, a dish of ice cream, a handful of potato chips, and some red punch. Fourth and final day, a quarter tube of toothpaste, any brand, a bite of soap, and one olive. Pour a glass of milk over a bowl of cornflakes, add a half a cup of sugar once the milk is soggy, drink it, and then feed the cereal to the dog. Lunch, eat crumbs off the kitchen floor and the dining room carpet, find that lollipop and finish it. Dinner, a glass of spaghetti and chocolate milk. Leave the meatball on the plate, one stick of mascara for dessert. That's it. Four days of that, my friends, and no doubt, when you look in the mirror, you will find a leaner and meaner you. The diet is guaranteed to work, but you got to be committed to it. Commitment. That's the series that we're doing. And as I mentioned last week, during these next weeks, we are preparing as a church for our time of commitment to our auditorium expansion. That will happen during weekend services on February 22nd and 23rd. But you know, all of this is about so much more than just expanding our auditorium. Our hope, from the elders on out, our hope is that this moment in our church history will begin a conversation in people's homes. A conversation in people's homes where we begin to talk about what truly matters to us. What's really important? What do we genuinely value? 
This is what the home vision events are really all about. I know we mention them a lot, but they really have been great. I went to one just last night, and it was great. We were there till 10 o'clock talking just about our lives and things like that. And since last weekend alone, 90 more people have been to these events. So this is something that really keeps growing, and I want to encourage you to keep going, to, to, to sign up for one. Even if you've been to one, to go to another one if you want to. And one sentiment that I find that's coming from everyone at these meetings is the concern that people have for their families. I am particularly moved by the folks who are single for whatever reason, or folks who for whatever reason don't have children. The sincere concern that even those folks that they have in our church for our families, especially for the young families in our church, I mean, it's inspiring. Because the reality is, we all have a family. None of us just showed up. And whether we have the perfect 1950s TV, Father Knows Best family, or our house is more like the family guy, this church is committed to your family. Our family prayer hour on Wednesday was again filled with families praying. 41 families prayed together this Wednesday evening. There are people right now on the other side of this wall praying right now for all your prayer requests. And if you fill one out, one of those cards that are up on the wall on the other side of this wall. And there are people right now in that room praying, praying for your needs, praying for this service, praying for our church, praying for our families. Our commitment to families in this church is not only that because families are important, but because families are treasured here. Families are treasured because biblically, children in a community are seen not only as a blessing, but as a concrete sign of God's favor. Biblically, children in a community are seen not only as a blessing, but as a concrete sign of God's favor. Which is why we say in this church that we are a church that has found favor in the eyes of the Lord. We found favor in the eyes of the Lord because God just keeps sending children to this church. And so it is in that spirit that this weekend we're going to examine the question of who will we serve? But specific, specifically, who will your family serve? How will your family serve? And why will your family serve? In Joshua 24, 15, we find the famous words, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It's a popular passage among believers. It's on refrigerator magnets, on wall plaques, and lampshades. It's all over the place in Christian homes. Yet how often is it that we actually challenge ourselves to determine whether that's really happening in our families or not. Well, we should. Because the idea of a family that serves the Lord, a family that really does serve God, that is how you build a legacy family. That's how you find God's favor. And so this weekend, what we want to do is help your family, however that family looks, help your family start the conversation as to whether or not you truly do serve the Lord. And that conversation, believe it or not, begins with a spirit of joy and of prayer and of gratitude and thankfulness. You see, this is the thing about serving. Biblical serving is a response. Serving isn't a first act. Serving is a responding act. Biblical serving is a response to God's goodness. That's why if you want your family to serve the Lord, you have to have a thankful family. If you want your family to serve the Lord, you actually have to have a thankful family. That is the key to understanding genuine biblical serving because serving is a response to God's goodness. In the Bible, we see from cover to cover, God constantly calling on his people to be thankful and to learn gratitude. This passage here from 2 Corinthians is a favorite for me because it ties so many things together. It talks about grace. It talks about reaching people. It talks about God's glory. But mostly, it shows us that thankfulness overflows. That means when we are genuinely thankful to God, it comes out of us. It pours out of us. How? By serving. Our thankfulness overflows out of us through servanthood. This is why thankfulness is the foundation of biblical servanthood. Thankfulness is the foundation of biblical servanthood. Here's why. 
without a sense of gratitude to God, without a sense of thankfulness. Serving is a burden. Otherwise, serving is a chore. Otherwise, serving becomes just an obligation. But serving God ought to be joyful. Look at this beautiful passage from 1 Samuel. It's mind-opening. It says, fear the Lord. And that doesn't mean be afraid. It means to have a respectful sense of God's power. Have a respectful sense of God's power. Serve him faithfully. Why? Because of all the great things he has done. Do you see how serving is a response to God's goodness? Serve God faithfully, it says, with all our hearts. Consider all the great things he's done. This is why a serving family, that, a family that serves God, has to first be a thankful family. Because serving is the overflow of our hearts to God. You know, the whole business of being thankful is something that is taught to us from a very young age. Every generation of parents since the beginning of time has taught the next generation about being grateful and expressing thankfulness. When my Aunt Flora brings over her Velveeta Spam and broccoli casserole, and my mom would ask me, Robert, what do you say to Aunt Flora for her Velveeta Spam and broccoli casserole? Even as a kid, I knew that my mom did not really want to know what I would say. My mom would have been floored if I said, Aunt Flora, what in the name of heaven were you thinking? You should not be allowed to prepare meals for human beings. Someone should just put you away. Now, my parents would have been floored if I said that, and then I would have been floored if I had said that. I was expected to say, thank you. Now, let's just be real about this. My parents would have been equally floored if I had said, Aunt Flora, your Velveeta Spam and broccoli casserole has created a sense of awe and wonder that I have never experienced as a child. You are a humanitarian in the name of children everywhere. I salute you, Aunt Flora. That would not have worked either. And there is good reason. Because we all know that while a child may not really feel gratitude, we want them to learn it. We want them to learn how to do it because our hope is that over time they will develop grateful hearts and become and learn to be grateful people. So today, what I want to do is, in the sort of the spirit of the four-day toddler miracle diet, is offer you a sort of four-day family diet of gratitude. And I believe that if you commit to this diet for four days of gratitude, that you can actually cultivate a heart of gratitude in your family. You can actually cultivate a heart of gratitude in your family that will naturally overflow into a lifetime of service to Christ. Now that is the point that we need to carry home, that by, ca by cultivating a heart of gratitude in your family, it will naturally overflow into a lifetime of service to Christ. That's how you build a legacy family. That is the treasure. Day one, it begins like any other lifestyle regimen, and that is you have to choose. The first thing you have to do is make the decision that you want to make true serving a part of your family DNA. It is part of what defines who you are. It sounds simple, but you know, this is where it all begins, really. Everything that we do of true, lasting, life-changing consequence comes from after making some sort of a decision. Ask yourself, have we as a family ever really decided that we would be a serving family? Did we make that conscious choice? Did we have the conversation that says, we're going to have to decide if we're going to serve and who we're going to serve? Have you had that conversation as a family? And I got to tell you, all of these babies being born around this place, you new parents, this is the question you want to be having. This is the conversation you want to be having in your homes. Because when we ask, who will we serve? The question behind that question is what kind of family are we going to be? What kind of family are we going to be? Are we going to be a grateful family? A family that is so thankful for what God has already done, thankful for what God has already done, that serving naturally overflows from us. 
You know, if you are waiting for God to do something and then you're going to be thankful, you will never be thankful. And if we raise children that learn to be thankful only after God has done something for them, they will never be truly thankful people. So day one, very simply, you've got to choose what type of family you are going to be. Just spend a day talking about how much God has already done for you and how are you going to respond to that. You know, whether there's one of you or ten of you, you just ask, who are we going to be? These are legacy family questions. Ask yourselves, what kind of family are we going to be? And then choose to be grateful people. Now, day two, I realize that you can't just flip a switch and be grateful. You can't force yourself to feel thankful. Gratitude involves a way of seeing, perceiving, and understanding life. But we can learn it. And we can practice it. And we can make it more real in our lives and in your family's lives. And if you have really spent a day considering all that God has done for you, and you've decided that this is who you want to be, a serving family, then on day two, be grateful for the imperfect. See, 1 Thessalonians says to give thanks in all circumstances. You know what that means? That means to be thankful in the good and the bad the perfect and the imperfect, all circumstances. You know, once we stop waiting for things to get perfect, we learn to appreciate all the imperfect things we already have. The fact is that the things that we really ought to be grateful for are usually much closer and much more real and much more available than we realize. They're just imperfect. Ask yourself, have you ever received an imperfect gift? If you are married, And you are here with your spouse. You are sitting next to an imperfect gift. You can take a look at that gift right now if you want to. You are sitting next to an imperfect gift, but so is the person sitting next to you. Do you have kids? They are an an imperfect gift. Praise them for being imperfect. If I had waited until my kids became perfect before I praised them, I would have never praised them at all. It did not take long for my my wife, Jean, and I to realize that we did not conceive nor give birth to perfect children. No. Apparently, that skips a generation. (laughs) Because our grandchildren are perfect. And I don't want to hear no different. You want to know why your kids are imperfect? They have imperfect parents. Now, isn't that true? Aren't our parents imperfect? Do I have to convince anyone of that? I'm uh, flying out this afternoon to go see my mother. She's 88, and uh, I'm going just for a couple days. But in those two days of reconnecting with my mom, I know that she will remind me that she did not have perfect children in the way only my mother can. (laughs) And I will remind her that I did not have perfect parents. We'll both be reminded Flawed as life may be, we need to learn to be grateful for the imperfect. Imperfect bodies, imperfect homes, imperfect friends, imperfect work, imperfect minds, imperfect lives. If we wait for the perfect, we will never be grateful at all. We must learn to be grateful for imperfect gifts because those are the only ones that we are going to get in this world. Other than the perfect gift, of the perfect, loving, gracious, sacrificial forgiveness of Jesus Christ, we will never receive any other perfect thing in this life. Now, if you are serious about this, I have an exercise that you can do which will actually help you learn to be able to see and appreciate and to be grateful for the imperfect things in your life. So if you're willing, here goes. This is it. One day this week, I want you to make it a no complain day in your family. No complaining. One day. See how long you can go in your family without complaining. Just start in the morning and see who can make it through the whole day. See, now some of you are grumbling right now. You're saying, who, what a waste of time. Whose dumb idea was that? What's that tell you already, people? You know what? We could all pick the same day. How about like Wednesday. Wednesday is the note. Wait a minute. Let me see what's on my calendar first. Who am I meeting with? How about Thursday? Let's make Thursday. (laughs) 
fine, Wednesday. <laughs> but what if we all did that together? Now, how's that for an idea? Imagine church-wide, entire families agreeing that for the same day on when, one day, there would be no complaining. I mean, we could really have fun with it. We'd make it a contest. We could have lousy prizes, and no, the winner would get a brown and crisp meal, you know? <laughs> but no one could complain. You'd make it a marathon. Go one day, two days, three days, no complaining about anything. No complaining about dinner or your room or laundry or report, card, report cards, teenagers. This is the golden opportunity to say to your parents, you're always telling me I should listen to Pastor Han. Well, I'm listening. Let's have a no complaining contest. Just remember, that sword cuts both ways. Think about it. I mean, it could really get out of hand. But by the end, if you're all still alive, you'd learn to appreciate the less than perfect things in life. So that's the first two days. Choose what kind of family you're going to be. Be grateful for the imperfect. And third, be grateful for life itself. You know what? Life is good. Life is good, not because we make it good. Life is good, not because others make it good. Life is good, not because we feel good at the moment. Life is good because ultimately life belongs to God, and it comes from God, and God is good. Psalm 119 says it straight out. You are good, and what you do is good. And God does life. So life is good good. Friends, have we ever stopped to consider that the message the world needs to hear from our families is that life is good? Life is good. Yes, there is often pain and suffering attached to it, but life itself is a good thing. And as it was intended by God to be lived, life is a very good thing. I want you to try something. Look down at your left hand for a moment. Just look at your left hand for a second. Look down at it and just notice it. Even move it around a little bit. Notice that it works. It doesn't have to. There are people who don't have a hand that works. That's something to be grateful for if your left hand works. Some of you have a watch on the wrist of that hand, and it keeps ticking. Every time it ticks, that's another gift. Every tick is a gift from God. You didn't manufacture one single tick on, the, on your watch, on that ticking through life. You can't guarantee one single tick. It's just sheer grace ticking. Life is a gift. We cannot take it for granted. It can be lost in a second, and it is every day. We saw that yesterday, didn't we? It is good to be alive. Friends, life is too short. However long or short it lasts, it is still too short. We cannot and we dare not wait for someone or something to come along so that we can become grateful. We've got to take our own responsibility for this. We've got to choose to be grateful. We've got to learn to appreciate the imperfect gifts that come along a day and be grateful for life itself. And you know how we do that? Show someone. Tell someone that you are grateful that they are alive. Just do it. Show and tell someone that you are grateful that they are alive. I ask you to look at your hand. Well, maybe sitting real close to that hand is another person, imperfect as they may be. There is someone right there next to your hand that you can be thankful for. Maybe it's a good friend or a spouse or a child. And you can take that hand and you can touch the arm of that person next to you. Or you can put your arm around their shoulder. Or you can give their knee a little squeeze. You know, you could do that now. Now, if it's a sta stranger sitting next to you, I mean, that might not, <laughs> might not be the best thing. Human touch is a powerful, powerful thing. Years ago when my kids were small and we took them to Disney World, when Mickey Mouse came out, you know, he was mobbed by the little kids. And the kids all wanted the same things. All our girls jumped up and down and they would say, hug me, hug me. You know, and then Belle from Beauty and the Beast would come out and our daughters would jump up and down and yell, hug me, hug me. And then the handsome Prince Charming would come out and my wife would begin jumping up and down. <laughs> But that's a story for another day. The point is that touch, when appropriate and respectful, touch 
is one of the most powerful forms of expressing gratitude and praise. To embrace somebody or to place a hand on somebody's shoulder. Jesus did this all the time. Parents brought their children out to him to be touched and blessed, even though his own followers didn't understand. You got somebody you love, somebody you're grateful for, hug them, shake their hand, kiss them. These are powerful expressions, not just of affection, but of gratitude, that, that we are thankful that these people are alive in our lives. Maybe not everybody, but certainly somebody. The Bible's always talking about how when Jesus saw someone or spoke to them, he would touch them. He touched children, he touched blind people, he touched sick people, he touched lepers, people that nobody else would touch. Jesus would touch them and he would heal them. You know why? Because Jesus loved people and Jesus loved life. He came and he lived and he died to provide eternal life to those who accept him as their savior and the leader of their lives. You know, friends, all the earth is a gift and life is the most precious gift of all. Jesus offers not just physical life, but he brings us the promise of eternal life. Because we can all choose to be more grateful as people. And we can all learn to be more grateful about the imperfect things in our lives. And we can all learn to just be grateful for life itself, and that is good. But this life is temporary. And one day it will end for each one of us. And my deepest hope is that every person who hears this message will accept and be grateful for the gift of eternal life that is offered only through Jesus Christ. Now what I'm about to say may sound like it's directed at only those here this morning who are Christians, but I'm asking those of you who are not yet Christians to really pay attention to this part especially. Think about it this way. If I consider myself a follower of Christ, but I'm not a grateful person, Here's what I'm saying. If I consider myself a follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm not a grateful person, I am saying that Jesus Christ is not enough. What I'm saying is that I was made in the image of God. Not only that, but God loves me. God calls me his own child. God came to teach, live, die on the cross, be resurrected, so that my eternity with God is assured forever. And that's not all I have. I have been received into God's wonderful gift, the biblical community of the church. I belong to a community where I can love and be loved. And that's not all. I've been given gifts by the Holy Spirit. I've been made in a unique way to make an eternal contribution to the work of God. I've got a mission, and God works through me even though I mess up sometimes. So if I'm not grateful now, I'm saying it's not enough. John 3.16 is not enough. The gift of life, that I am a child of God, that I have salvation through Christ, that I have the community of the church, that I have guidance and power through the Holy Spirit. I'm saying that's not enough. I know that for a lot of people, you've been let down by religion, let down by churches, let down by life. You look at your circumstances and you say, how can I possibly be, be grateful for what's happening in my life right now? If that's where you are today, then where else but to the healing touch of Jesus Christ, where else have you got to go? Where else but into the arms of God are you going to fall? Who do you think brought you here today if it wasn't Jesus? Working through his people, working for you, serving us already through his community. That's why we're here. If you're hurting and broken and scarred, that's why we are here. Be grateful for Jesus Christ. So that's it. Choose what kind of family you're going to be. Be grateful for the imperfect. Be grateful for life itself. Be grateful for Jesus Christ. Friends, if we do this, person by person, family by family, frankly, even if we just try in a very short time, we will have thousands of families that serve the Lord. It will naturally pour out. And those families will be used by God to transform other families, and on and on and on. That's the treasure. That's the legacy. Because as thankfulness overflows out of us and God's people serve, the world notices. It always has. 
We're going to close in song. And as we do that, I urge you to consider very simply this. Who is going to get the overflow of our gratitude? What is enough? Who is enough? Whom shall we serve? All I need do is consider how God has already been good to me. And the answer is simple. For me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You can have all this world. Just give me Jesus.